Thank you. Um, we have several hands up. Um, Mike, is it? And then Howard? So just very briefly from the PMI perspective, um, I can, uh, uh, having been at the last couple of working groups, they are, they are constantly cognizant of the fact that d diversity is, is a critical element in the design of it. But there, to refine the, 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 uh, the debate at this point is that um, representative uh, um, cohort might serve some social and political um, purposes, but the scientific questions might not be served. It, um, so some refinement on exactly which subgroups would you want to go beyond representative and enrich. Um, a 12% African American might be, might, if, well, while it's representative, wouldn't necessarily afford you the, the right number to do good science. So that's one thing that would, would uh, you know, what, how do you set those priorities? The second thing is, is just the, the uh, any experience that, that this group has in um, affecting the, the um, specifics of enhancement that is desired would be where I think the, the PMI could, could garner, um, could, could gain from that kind of insight. Yeah. Howard? So I agree with the, the comment that was just made in terms of uh, really it's a sample size issue and, and you know, we've, we've found that in ourselves with our cancer studies that we have proportional representation from a population census standpoint, but it's underpowered to really draw any conclusions. So I, I definitely agree with that. Um, from a clinical trial standpoint, there's also a couple other issues that come up. I'm Gary Puckering from uh, the National um, uh, was the National Minority Health Quality Forum or whatever, whatever it's called, um, has done some nice mapping showing that uh, clinical trials are not readily available in areas where um, there's greatest minority density or greatest diversity. And so even though there might be a clinical trial available in in, uh, in Tampa, it may not be where the groups are that, uh, that could uh, participate. Um, and, and therefore, you know, there's some, some uh, issues that could be solved, if you will, um, there. Um, another thing is we have a, a paper coming out in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute where we looked at people who, had, who enrolled on clinical trials, uh, clin uh, cooperative group trials, and so they'd already agreed to be on a trial. So they bypassed some of the, the historic issues. And yet they, the, um, the non-white uh, patients were underrepresented in the genomic component. And it turns out equally underrepresented in any of the correlative science. And as we drilled down, it was because they were treated at centers that were under-resourced. And so they didn't have the, the expertise or the extra research nurse or whatever it might be to enroll on that extra trial and therefore didn't have the genomics and extra fits like that there. So it had nothing to do with, with um, it, with, with race per se, it was, it was more to do with economics in terms of the, the, the resource uh, utilization. And the centers that were well resourced, there was an equal representation in terms of uh, white versus non-white. So it was, really came down to just the centers where they were treated. Um, and so I think there's some issues there. And then lastly, um, many of the, of the um, patients that are, uh, or any of the areas that are represented with a high percentage of diversity are treated by uh, physicians that may not be um, a, a Hispanic or African American or whatever. They might be Pakistani or there might be something else. And so I think from an education, clinical education standpoint, we need to be educating people who treat uh, areas with high uh, diversity density, not only uh, the, uh, the clinicians that might happen to represent a minority group. And so I, th I think if we want to get to patients, we need to treat who's treating them um, and not uh, and and not otherwise. Yeah, Terry, did you want to mention? Uh, yeah, if I could. Uh, excellent points that that have been made so far, and I I echo everything that that Howard has said, and and all of you. We, we didn't unfortunately have a chance to have Vince or, or Craig introduce themselves, but but uh, Vince is responsible for diversity and health disparities. Do I, did I get that right in NHGRI? He's so. responsible with trying to help and help solve them. <laughs> he, <laughs> <laughs> That's, Yes. Nice <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for getting that right. Yeah, and and Craig, you've done this kind of kind of research in in Hispanic populations for decades, as, as I understand it. 
Oh, three and a half, wow. And, and, and so, the, you know, I think the question we need to ask, because, because many of the issues that have been raised, I think, are, are common to uh, um, research in, in lots of different areas, not, not just genomics. So what is it about genomics that makes this particularly difficult, or maybe it's not any more difficult than, than otherwise? But I, but I think when, when I look at NHGRI, so I came to NHGRI from the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. At Heart, Lung, and Blood, we had, you know, fairly consistently 25 percent or even greater uh, representation, particularly of African Americans, because that's where the disease was. I mean, that, you know, terrible hypertension and heart disease and stroke and that sort of thing. And so, so it was an, an area that we really pushed, and we had a leadership that insisted and, and put systems in place to do that. I came to NHGRI, and, and you couldn't get non-European ancestry populations through study sections because, you know, they're, they're diverse, and that messes up the linkage maps and that, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we need to think carefully about why we've done so poorly, and I would say poorly, in, in the genomics field, particularly looking at GY. You know, we're doing a little bit better now in that we have Asian populations in a big way, not from the U.S., but, but from Asia, uh, but we still are, I think, underrepresented in, in other groups. So, so you know, there's, a, there's the dark legacy of, of eugenics and, and, you know, mistrust of the way this information might be used against people to demonstrate inferiority. Um, you know, there are, there are other concerns about, um, uh, um, you know, how to, how to be sure that, that the representation of, of, of people with different genomes then gets used for them rather than to, to inform the majority of, oh, we see this, this uh, uh, variant in, you know, Alaska Natives in a high pr proportion, so it must not be very important in the European ancestry population. You know, that may be a useful piece of information, but it's not the, 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 the thing that will be useful to them. So, so as Vince said, you know, can we identify health disparities questions that are really important that are genomic? And, and if we can do that, I think that then we have the scientific argument along with all the other arguments for doing this kind of research, and that would help us to sort of design those programs. I, I, yeah. In the back so, and, then, um, and then here. When you mentioned the idea of using the difficulties of infrastructure for, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> When you speak about the infrastructure barriers related towards implementing some of these tools, such as um, the use of the Internet, I think you'll find out that there are opportunities that are available to overcome those. There's several investigators that have actually used, uh, overcome those barriers by utilizing technologies that are actually developed for that. Um, in addition, one of the things we realized just from my own experience is having to work in, working in impoverished you know, communities that don't have access to the infrastructure that have access to the knowledge um, to recruit them into different protocols from NIH is related more towards they have a central person that they can talk to. They, no matter what the situation is, there's one person they can pick up the phone and call, and they actually develop a rapport with that person. And, you know, best example I have is, you know, Dr. Powell, Dr. Tiffany Powell, and yes, it's a shameful plug for my wife, but her program is dedicated towards doing exactly that. You, developing mobile technology in areas that are impoverished, don't have the infrastructure, and to get recruit underrepresented populations. And she's gone to faith-based initiatives, and it took a year or two to buy in for them because it needed the church to build it, buy in, but they are, they've been on board, and she's brought like 150 people to the clinical center based off of that kind of simple structure of just she's always there. And so I think what you'll find is if you utilize the one person kind of concept that they have that person to go to. Uh, the barriers for the IT infrastructure, those can be, those tools are available to offset that. And we've used some of those tools firsthand, so I know that they work. Um, you'll find that that will, that could help as far as your recruitment, because they, the patients actually try to, they just want to understand what's going on, why it's helpful to them. And they want somebody that they can talk to about that. And that's all I have to add for that. So I think I would like to add, and this builds a little off of, I think, what a lot of people have been saying, but to Synergies, H3 Africa, because there isn't a barrier or opportunity up there that, that they don't face tenfold, and the scientific imperative to include the diversity um, is, is larger and harder. Um, and so at NHGRI, we've been talking a lot about uh, um, working together on some of the community engagement strategies because they've come up with some really um, novel ways of doing things. And I think that trust relationship and building a trust relationship over time is a huge one, as well as, you know, identifying the appropriate community leaders that can help with that. Here. 
Sorry. We have here and then. Uh, I don't recall from the introductions how many people here were involved in pediatrics or child health, but I just want to point out the particular salience of this issue for pediatrics, so, um, which is both a, a challenge and an opportunity. So that we're very close to a majority-minority society already in pediatrics. I was just looking at the most recent numbers I could find were from 2009. We were 56 percent uh, white non-Hispanic, so that leaves 44 percent. You know, again, we're very close, and the 2015 numbers are probably even closer to majority-minority. So on the one hand, the, the challenges of diversity and disparities are, uh, and the sort of limited knowledge base is an even bigger deal for pediatrics than it is for other areas of genomic practice. On the other hand, there's an opportunity there because research that's done in pediatric populations is almost inevitably going to be more diverse or enroll more diverse populations than it would be if it were done in older and adult populations. So pediatrics, I think, is an opportunity to start to, start to address this diversity challenge we're all struggling with. Okay. We have here and then back. Yeah. So I wanted to get back to Terry's comment about uh, you know, the initial in the scientific community, the initial, uh, you know, push for homogeneity and lack of diversity. Um, and so, so I think one of the issues there is, and what I think is a, is a concrete uh, suggestion as well, is the lack of uh, real great or good methods to exploit admixed uh, genomes uh, for discovery. And we find this now that in, in, in our research uh, through methods that are based on identity by descent and some other methods, one can actually exploit sort of the diversity in the, in, in, in the population in, in, in our biobank. And one of the things that I think would be helpful is to think about ways to increase funding for method development, specifically addressing these issues. Uh, new methods, particularly as it comes to uh, sequence data, um, and associations and all of that in, in uh, admixed populations. Um, I wanted to make a second point, and that gets back to one item that you had on, on one of your slides, and that is a community advisory board. And one of the aspects that we found um, incredibly helpful as part of our uh, IGNITE project was is enrolling uh, exclusively African Americans uh, because the genetic, the genotype that is linked to our disease of interest is uh, prevalent in, in African American populations and not in others. And what was incredibly helpful was that the community advisory board coming in very, very early in the development of the study to the extent that they actually were almost writing the consent form. So our community people have a different way of looking at the language that is used in consent, talking about genetics, talking about genetic risk, talking about data sharing, and you know it was received with much greater, um, um, it was it was much more effective than what we typically use in in in, in the ordinary study. So I think that's a very important point to bring out. How can uh, community advisory boards and and others uh, be um, uh, engaged very, very early in, in a participatory way uh, rather than um, uh, at a later point when things are written and uh, approved by IRB, et cetera, et cetera. Carol, that, oh, you've that, got him. Uh, well, I was just going to make exactly. been trying to say something for ages. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was just going to make the same point, really, um, <clears throat> is that if, uh, if you bring the community of study with you right from the beginning, even from the beginning of uh, designing the research, um, it's a particularly effective way of getting better recruitment and better participation. Uh, it has to, of course, not look token. Um, and it also, um, of course, you have to hear um, criticism and, and those sorts of things, which for some people can, can be awkward. But uh, 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 comparisons are odious, but we had the same problem with Aboriginal Australians involved in clinical trials, um, um, and the only way around it was to give quite a lot of autonomy or, or independence and ability to say difficult things to the researchers from the community advisory board right from the beginning, and things have changed extraordinarily after five or six years of that. Yeah, I just wanted to very briefly amplify on your point with regard to pediatric populations. So with uh, pediatric genetic diseases, we have uh, um, two more whammies on top of this. 
Uh, one is that our databases have few uh, pathogenic variant annotations from minority populations. And second is that in genetic diseases in general, one of the most powerful pieces of evidence we have in terms of likely pathogenicity is allele frequency, accurate allele frequencies. And for many of many minority populations, we wind up with hundreds or even thousands of variants um, that are novel or have very low allele frequencies just because they're underrepresented in our database, which means the quality of our interpretation today lags far behind in minority populations versus, say, nor Northern Europeans. So I, I have I, 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 so shy I have a <laughs> I have a footnote to the pediatric uh, discussion and, and that is a phenomenon that, that one of our pediatric geneticists thought she saw in her clinic and now we have really nice PCI based data that uh, not on, we have an increasingly biracial community not admixed but an increasingly number of biracial children at our hospital and it's 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 very clear when you look at PCI plots by decade that in the last two decades we see sort of a cloud blossoming right in the middle between blacks and whites so that that complicates Steve's data interpretation in an order of magnitude or two uh, as as the country becomes not only more diverse but but the genetic ancestries become much more hard to define as just one of the major ancestry groups Sorry, who are you pointing at, Carol? Oh, yeah. Hi, to, to build on Dr. Kingsmore's comment about just the, um, the disparate knowledge bases in, in non-European populations, um, to the allele frequency issue, I just wanted to highlight that the PAGE program that was mentioned is going to be amassing allele frequency data on 50,000 non-European populations on about eight to 10,000 variants that are in ClinVar and other loss of function um, variants. So I think that will you know, be just part of a resource that could be used. And, and I also wanted to make the broader point that I think when thinking about variant interpretation and the underlying knowledge base, you know, the, the, human, the human association literature is very vast and I think it's, it's wise to sort of keep the epi, epi colleagues in the loop as well, that that dialogue could be fostered um, better as well. So I, I also wanted to, to build on Stephen's point about, about the, the lack of data and the lack of ability to interpret variants in, in non-European ancestry populations. And when, when you think about it, this is a disincentive to investigators to study those groups because you're going to solve fewer cases and your, you know, your, your applications will do poorer in review, et cetera. I wonder, has, has anyone really published that finding and shared this with community groups and others and said, you know, this is a huge problem in terms of using genomics in the care of your children and, and you know, in, the, in the, the care of this population. And is there some way to get, we, we recognize that community, community advocacy can be very powerful. So, so I, I might ask Vincent Craig and, and others who work with populations, is, is this a, a, a useful message or would this damage us further in the, in the eyes of, of these groups? I think it could be a useful message, and it depends how it's delivered. Uh, and one of the mark remarks I was going to make was really kind of following up on this issue of trust and how messages are communicated and how information is communicated and the trustworthiness of the researchers and those that are communicating information. So I think if it's articulated in the right way, it could be very valuable. At the end of the day, it's communities by and large, and, and being in the community, there's no substitute for it. Um, I, we've done some 28,000 exams over the last 34 years, and we've probably been in every one of those homes multiple times. Uh, not me, because I'm not part of the community, uh, but the community workers have been there and it's made a huge difference, and they're able to transmit that information and get over some of the, the biases, the misunderstanding, the other challenges that come, the faith-based organizations become critical in this because there's a, a, a cultural destiny, you know, with family and genetic data, and genetic data is, is frightening, and yet it's also very comforting that, okay, I don't have to do anything about this, and, and overcoming some of those uh, feelings and thoughts becomes a, an important aspect of that. But at the end of the day, it's being in the community and being there for quite a while. 
Uh, we'll see some changes. I'll put a plug for Texas. We're putting a medical school on the border between Texas and Mexico. Uh, it will change what we do and how, how we access at least one population of a couple million people. My comment isn't obviously to undermine the importance of uh, increasing the diversity of uh, people who are in the databases and for whom we have variant and frequency information. But I also want to acknowledge that it, it's more challenging than just getting people into the um, data sets. Um, I, I do bone marrow transplantation in my clinical life, and we all know that it's much harder to find an unrelated donor match for somebody who's from a non-European background. And part of that is because there aren't enough donors in the donor banks, the cord blood registries, but part of it is because the genetic diversity is so much greater amongst people from non-European backgrounds, or many non-European backgrounds, than it is from European backgrounds. And so part of it is really just a uh, sort of population genetic diversity background that makes this challenging. It's going to it's, it's harder to solve than just getting more people into the databases in order to get their uh, variant data. So Terry and Eric, I have a question for you. So. You know, the, the, the scientific imperative, the social justice imperative, those are both pretty clear. A lot of the solutions that people have had success with are not things you would write necessarily into an R01, so community advisory groups and, and those kinds of building the trust in the communities. That's not really something one would put necessarily in an independent sort of R01, is it? I mean, what, what are the mechanisms for having impact in this area from a, from a funding perspective? Is it, would it be meeting proposals? What, what kinds of things would people do? Yeah, and I think what, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Um, you know, we actually don't have a lot, um, it, at least in, in our, you know, science of medicine and, and effectiveness of healthcare portfolio, and we probably need them. Do we need dedicated programs just for, for these kinds of questions? Do we need supplements that could provide these additional resources, particularly in under-resourced settings where a lot of these patients are found? Uh, you know, I think all of those are, are possibilities. And events, what, what do you think? I agree with that. I think supplements and ways to integrate. Thinking about the two divisions, the genomic and medicine and the genomic and society, are there ways to do some more integrative kind of research studies where you're bringing these issues? You're studying how do you engage with the community right. as part of your research as well as doing the basic genomics work. And so thinking about different kinds of ways and strategies may be a way that we all can think about how to really move this, this conversation, this direction, this research. Because Mark is getting ready to speak, and I yep. can't let Mark speak. Um, <laughs> so actually, you know, one of the things when, when the PAGE program, Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiology, which was adding GWAS basically on top of large cohort studies that our, our colleagues and other institutes had funded, one of the things that we looked at was this, you know, huge lack of data in diverse populations. And we said, all right, this program is going to be all non-European ancestry populations. And maybe what we need to do is, is more programs that are all non-European ancestry, because it at least then they have a little bit more of a level playing field. I mean, still the smaller groups are going to lose out to the bigger groups again because there's more data, but, but that may be an approach. And, and Vince, it's fair, and, and I'm also trying to prevent Mark from speaking. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, and it's fair to say this is exactly what Vince is doing in the co-chairing role of one of the internal groups that's helping give uh, sort of implementation guidance, advice about for the Precision Medicine Initiative, and I think all options, all scenarios are on the table, um, of, and, and there's, because there's not a cookie cutter answer that to this, and we know that, and so, but, but this is being thought about, again, not just at the NHGRI level, but even broader uh, other initiative. We think about these things for some common fund projects as well, and certainly are going to be thinking about it for the Precision Medicine Initiative. I was just going to make one last comment is that other EICs are interested in working with us on this so that there are more collaborative relationships around this specific topic area um, that bring resources and expertise from other institutes and their interests. Mark? So this is a question. I know that um, in uh, the uh, grant proposals that there is frequently in the RFAs a call for, um, you know, uh, training programs for um, 
uh, a minority or other uh, investigators. And, and I still, you know, I see on there the lack of involvement of minority investigators and physicians. And I also recognize the point that you're making is that it may not be at the investigator level that's the most important point of engagement with these communities. But the question that I have is, um, what has been the result of evaluation of the intent to develop training within the RFAs? Has that resulted in an improvement in the number of uh, investigators, uh, clinician investigators that are coming into the space to, um, to lead these trials? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I'll, I'll call on others at, at NIH to comment as, as well, and maybe um, our, let's see, oh, Cashel has left, and so is Barb Conley. Okay, so we're on our own, Dina. I don't know if you have a, a comment. I, I think um, the, the training that we've tended to do within our program, there hasn't been a lot, I, I, at least in the programs I've been involved in. We have had some minority and diversity action plan uh, programs that have been more in the basic science programs. Um, there, there hasn't been a great deal, and it's been very difficult to retain such folks in, in science, and, and I think that's a, an NIH-wide and a science-wide problem that I'm not sure that we can, we can address necessarily. But, um, but I think to the degree that we can say, um, yes, this is an, an area of emphasis for us, and, and we, we really need to, to determine and figure out ways to increase genomic research in diverse populations, I think that is within the realm of NHGRI and, and something that we can do. How best to do it, I think, are, is a testable question that we can look at. So I guess maybe to come back at that, um, uh, you know, I can, uh, in some ways when you, when you haven't had success, then the question is, well, you know, what haven't we gotten right? And, and I'm wondering if genomics would be a potential point of engagement. In other words, is this an area where there could be an exceptional quality to understanding um, uh, you know, these disparities and, and inviting people to participate. I, I, I would think that there might be some sort of a, a social research agenda around that question that, that could be approachable. Um, I don't know, that's just, you know, shooting off the forehead. Vince at least isn't looking completely skeptical, like he usually does when I talk, so. I know for the um, for the SEERS, I mean, it was a, an important part of charge for the SEERS to include training of minority, uh, you know, students, and it was very successful at our institution. Um, hopefully, going forward, I assume that that's going to be a part of the new RFAs that are out now um, to fund additional SEER centers. But um, you know it you know, made them make an effort in that area, and fortunately they were extremely successful in no small part from some of the things that I mentioned before. I just want to add, I know someone referenced the, the Common Fund programs, and I think this would be a really interesting conversation to have with Hannah Valentine and her team since they're coordinating these diversity uh, workforce training programs across the NIH, and I think they've got a, a better sense of what's working and not working globally at the NIH, and maybe this focused discussion with them on how could we engage more in the space of genomics so, as a small part of their bigger program would be a good starting point. Any other comments? Oh, in the back, yes. I, I will add in something really quickly. There are um, some training initiatives also going on with the Big Data to Knowledge um, program that many of you are probably familiar with that you may also be able to um, capitalize upon. Okay. So I think uh, for the five points that um, Terry wanted each of the panels to sort of sum up on I think critical knowledge gaps. Um, we've identified a, a number of gaps um, related to increasing uh, diversity in the populations and healthcare systems and, and identified a, a number of barriers that recommended approaches in, included a kind of leveraging other programs within NIH that are focused on these issues, and it's really kind of an interesting blend of the social sciences and the genomic sciences. We might have to do that in a more uh, unique, but maybe even a more directed way, kind of what Terry was saying, where you might have a 
program that is very specific about you know, only accepting research that, that's going to work on some of these target populations um, and maybe increase the pool that way. Is that, did I interpret what you said correctly, Terry? Um, I, th I think so. Um, on methods development for working with the data in admixed populations, I forget who said that, but that was one of the recommendations. Um, in terms of the training needs, um, the training, I think, is, is at all levels. And, and NHGRI actually has been very proactive in, in doing, devoting uh, funds for training for um, at all of these different levels. And I think then the long term that's going to pay off, but I think that needs to, to uh, continue. And then the bedside to bench, that virtuous cycle, I'm not sure I have anything to that I can sum up from this discussion on, on that point, but um, for the others, that was my kind of summary takeaway from the discussion. Was there anything else people wanted to add to those points? I, I guess I just, I just might add on the, on the last one, the bedside to bench. Uh, you know, as we start to see novel variants or previously undescribed variants in genes, uh, from ethnic minority populations, they, it is a great opportunity to start to think about function and uh, it may represent new sites that we should be looking at in those proteins. So I, I think that that's a really interesting opportunity. Got it. Okay. Did I miss anybody? Okay, thank you. Great. All right. Th thank you, Carol, and thank you, everyone. Um, so we're we're now at the stage of of kind of summarizing, looking back at what we've what we've learned today. We thought it might be useful. All right. Are we at that stage? Yes. yes. Okay. I just got a, a sidelong glance from my co-chair made me nervous, but um, <laughs> at any rate, he'll, I'll probably get several more of those before before we finish. <laughs> yeah. So so I might ask uh, Rita before you uh, if you're heading up there because I was hoping you would switch to my screen. Uh, and maybe she's going up there to do that. Oh, great, okay, thank you. Because we, I think we have the system down now. Um, thank you much for, for doing that. And do I need to share again? Uh, so I will go up to share and my screen. Rita will stop sharing. Ah, beautiful, all right. Thank you very much, Rita. Um, and then if you could make it, maximize the screen up there. Yeah, you can just make it, make it big. Um, so, so what we've tried to do a little bit on the fly and, uh, and we'll, we'll obviously you know, try to, to refine this, feed it back to everyone as, as, uh, um, you know, after the meeting and, and that. And actually, we, we'll have a dinner. So um, you know, we're, we're sorry that we haven't uh, arranged one of our, our lavish um, government dinners that you're familiar with <laughs> <laughs> for you. Um, we're, we're leaving you on your own for, for dinner because the, the working group actually has to work over dinner. Um, and so, so we'll be be heading off to do that. Uh, actually, while I have the floor, I might just mention that any of you with a domain name that ends in .gov or .mil um, need to pay for your lunch, breakfast, or snacks, um, and uh, Rita can tell you how to, how to do that, so, so please be sure to, to get that done. But with that, with that now aside, um, so in, in terms of um, uh, evidence gaps, what, what we've tried to do here with a, a little bit of um, uh, collusion with those on either side of me um, is try to identify some of the key points, and in blue, it, you can tell I love blue, um, is, are, are things that might be particularly important, um, but they were just sort of our initial pass. And if you want to blue in thing, other things, that would be fine, or, or unblue sums, that would be, some, that would be fine as well. Um, I thought that the statement that for implementation you need evidence and for evidence you need implementation is a really, um, uh, you know, a take home message here. I'm not sure what we do with it other than worry, um, because, <laughs> because it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult to, to get the implementation done. But it, it probably also is a message to share with payers. I have no doubt that, that Jeff has tried to share that message with payers. Jeff, have you? Um, and have you gotten a, a response from them that's, you know, let somebody else pay for the, the implementation? Or It's always a work in progress. So, yeah. um, and I, actually, with this uh, discussion behind us, I think um, at least I'm reinvigorated to try again. 
Uh, one that, that seemed to, to resonate with folks was the idea that quality improvement projects generally don't get published, and is there a way to maximize sharing or learning uh, from those? And, and there, there should be some way. It would be novel and, and unusual, I think, but that's, we, we at the Genome Institute like to think we're in the novel and unusual space. Um, so, so how can we engage those? And maybe the HCSRN uh, is a way to, to go about doing that. Maybe there are other ways. But would, would folks agree that that's an opportunity we ought to to, we ought to at least try for. Would anyone disagree with that? Doesn't sound like it. Now, you, you only, I mean, it's only another half hour or so, folks, so stay with me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it's probably not even that long. I think um, the, the other thing I would just mention related to that, since this has come up several times, relates to methods. That the methods for QI research are different than the methods for traditional research, and, and there's uh, the opportunity to really. Um, uh, adapt methods for the particular question that you're trying to answer. So I think as we think about a repository potentially for methods, that including QI methods would be good. So Terry, I, I would, this is Julie over here. Um, I, I guess my only comment on this would be to not present it in a way that limits it to H, S, H, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> because I think everybody can do that. I mean, everybody can, everybody can, use a QI approach, and it's actually not very hard to publish data. You have to go through your IRB, but it's not really actually very hard to get approval to publish that. And it may be that, you know, there just needs to be better education around that, around how you publish those. This is just an opportunity to say again that it, rather than thinking about it as QI and research, if we think about learning healthcare infrastructures, we don't need to make these sharp distinctions between the two. We can just think of all, them all as different ways to learn stuff. Excellent point. Um, yeah, and, and I, I agree. Using the H, what used to be the HMR, and um, as, as sort of an example, you're absolutely right. There are lots of groups that can do this. Perhaps they're a group that we could start with because they are at least already organized um, and could, could help us point the way, but there are others. Uh, and, and recognizing the uniqueness of methods for this research. Uh, also recognizing that, again, you know, for, for the more laboratory-oriented folks, this may not seem like science. And, and you know, how do we deal with the areas that, that don't come across necessarily? Necessarily as being hard science, uh, and, and you know, demonstrate their value in the in the genomic space. So, um, we talked a bit about needing criteria for quality and types of evidence. I, I didn't have the feeling that that was as as resonating as it might be. The fact that it's come up in, in several of these meetings um, uh, sort of made me make it blue. But um, but what do people think? Is is this really one of those in the eye of the beholder, and every study needs to be designed um, for you know whatever evidence you're, you're or whoever you're trying to to convince, basically? So Mark is nodding. So that must be. I must have hit it. I just I, yeah. I, I guess based on my experience, I just don't think that uh, you know th there you know. There's a type of evidence that is just, you know, convincing to everyone, um, and so it, it does need to understand. You, you have to understand from the stakeholder what it is that they're looking for, and some stakeholder groups, like the payers, aren't that forthcoming with what they're really looking for. So I, I uh, yes, Jeff. I don't know if you have another slide on this, but it, but it seems like a related topic, which um, is the opportunity for creating an unfunded mandate across all of the networks that are uh, generating evidence to uh, agree on uh, certain types of evidence that they will collect and share. So um, uh, seriously, I, I think that's, uh, that at least um, should be reflected in, in my opinion as, the, as all the various groups uh, from Emerge to Insight to uh, Caesar and, and, and others that are really working on some forms of evidence generation to coalesce on this topic. Is that uh, something that, you know, it, whether unfunded or funded, um, is, is that an, an area that, that we really we could get the programs to come together on uh, and should get them to? Well, you get what you pay for, so an unfunded mandate will give you what you paid for. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, the, the, the idea of having a, uh, a, a either a, basically a, a mandate to try to capture this kind of data in the, in the projects where it fits best or, you know, there's going to be a lot of natural interest, and, and gradually these can be baked in. I mean, the DB gap was this wi wild, crazy thing that may or may not ever happen a few years ago, and now it's just part of, painful part of doing business, you know. So it, it, it becomes normal, and, you know, and I think that's what, 
uh, where Jeff is leading a lot of these is if we start it off, um, it will become normal as we learn the rules and, and get it going. Great. So, so mandate probably isn't the word that we want, but uh, but I, I don't have a, a chance to look up a synonym. So so we'll put it in put it in quotes and and recognize that that maybe some encouragement to try to do this across across the programs for for collecting and and sharing. And and this is a way that we can increase the impact of the programs, presumably. Um, skipping across the, you know, identifying payers' needs and patient needs. Um, we heard an interesting idea about making sort of the testing equivalent of pharmacovigilance studies. Uh, is there a way to follow up the outcomes of testing? Is there a, a way to incentivize? Incentivize is a good way, mandate across programs, incentivize across programs. Um, but incentivize either the testers or the people who paid for the testing to, to try to get some follow up information, um, particularly in integrated healthcare systems, which, as I understand, uh, do pay for a lot of this, that might be a, a place that, that would be useful for them and for us. So. Can't we incentivize the patients? So to what provide, would be the incentives to the patient, other than better health, I guess, but, to, but how would you do that? provide um, feedback, um, information, surveys, um, on, on the last bullet, um, it's not clear what the role for NHGRI would be in that exactly. Uh, it's probably worth discussing, but in the Evans, Jarvik, and Burke paper uh, in the New England Journal last week, they described that the FDA has undertaken something called a medical device surveillance system that looks at things like hip, re hip replacements and other those types of devices and is, um, is the equivalent of pharmacovigilance for devices. So the question would be, could um, uh, somehow NHGRI influenced the FDA to take on a genomic medicine surveillance system that does the same thing and captures data as tests go, you know, get, get de developed and marketed um, and figure out the way to capture the data just like they're doing with the, those other programs. Yeah, so one way is to, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff, uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and respond to Jeff and then I'll just going to say, you know, one of the ways to get people to do things is to make it part of regulations. That, that tends to, to lead to some unhappiness as, as well as, uh, but, you know, at least compliance. If, if there were an easier way, um, you know, because I think the other challenge is getting that into regulations can be a years-long process. But maybe I'm, I'm not understanding what you're suggesting. Well, I'm not going to propose a solution here, but I think the, the, you know, the easy thing is to engage the FDA in a discussion about this that this is a, an important driver for evidence generation and how do we work to, in a partnership, perhaps, to do so, but not be too prescriptive to say it should be regulated. Uh, one thing to just keep in mind with this whole topic is evidence for what purpose and what set of decision makers. So the evidence for a guidelines panel might be different than evidence for a payer might be different than evidence for a regulator. So I think you, you need to have this conversation with respect to each set of decision makers. Um, I was wondering, following up on Jeff's point, whether something like the vaccine safety data link uh, funded by the CDC would be um, more analogous to what you're thinking, which is um, more like a registry of um, people receiving the tests. I'm not familiar with that program, but I really love the idea of creating registries. It's really been informative in other areas of medicine where evidence generation is, is also required for therapeutic decision making. So that's concept we should insert into this discussion. So you know, part of in, you know, in ClinGen, there is the development of the, the Genome Connect registry for people who have had genetic testing. So that's a, something that's underway and, and building could be a model for that. Great. All right. Thanks much. I think that was, that's all we, uh, all we glean from evidence gaps. Obviously, we'll be going back, reviewing the, the videos and, and looking at our notes and that sort of thing. But, but at least for a first, a first effort, it sounds like we did pretty well with, uh, with that one. Uh, in terms of variant interpretation, um, um, I won't read through all of these, but the, the, some that seem to, to really be either novel or, or things that we really need to chew on. One was bringing more basic scientists to the table uh, to really help us in, in designing the research that's needed for variant interpretation, um, and so that they can learn, and this was Carol's suggestion in particular, you know, what, what challenging clinical questions are being faced and how, how best to address them. Um, and I, th I think we're also hearing from our, our more basic science colleagues that they, they want their research to be relevant to disease and health. I mean, that's one of the reasons they're in this business. Um, and they have ideas as well as to what might be useful and what might not. And, and having that dialogue could be a, a good thing. So uh, 
seemed like that resonates reasonably well. See heads, heads nodding. Um, facilitating data deposition um, through the possibility, perhaps, of covenants with a, coverage with evidence development through the payers. So, so rather than focusing just on CMS for CED studies, uh, could we work with the payers in a way? Um, and and we've, we've talked about before, we've had some interactions with payers. Um, and, and could we, now that the ground is softened a little bit and they're also recognizing that, uh, that they're going to have to deal with this in one, one way or another, um, could we perhaps try to do that kind of work? Is that something that we should make a priority, or do you think it's so unlikely that it's, it's sort of barking up the wrong tree? What do you think? I, I would tend to de-emphasize that, not because it isn't critically important, but because there just is so little ability to engage with payers in any sort of a, a centralized way. And so you end up doing it, um, you know, uh, as one-offs. Um, and again, there may be more of an opportunity through potential engagement with the more integrated systems that have payers as part of the delivery system where you can have more rational conversations about the alignment of an implementation project and where in some cases like Geisinger, there's actually investment from the health plan to the clinical system to do some of this in a cooperative way. Um, so I just, it, our experience with trying to engage with the payers um, has been that we can get them to the table and they can listen and they will talk, but in terms of actually doing anything going forward, that's been where we've really had a, a lack of success. So I would agree with Mark on an individual investigator level, but as a, as, as a health system or as a hospital, I, I would disagree. Cer certainly our institution is are doing a number of these, these uh, pilots with uh, the, the five biggest insurers, because that's our five customers, and they, they we're too big for them to ignore, and so they have to work with us, mm -hmm. and we want to work with them. So mm -hmm. it ends up being, a, in some cases, a, a very nice relationship, in some cases, a very forced but necessary relationship, mm -hmm. but it, it allows these kind of uh, coverage with, uh, with evidence type uh, projects to go forward. And they're not all genomic, mm -hmm. uh, they're across cancer. So I, I think it can be possible, but it just won't be the usual, it won't be an R01 method. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's really interesting, I, and I wonder if there might be, since many sitting around the table probably also come from institutions that are too big to be ignored, I wonder if there's an, uh, one, one opportunity might be to actually share the specific projects that we're doing it around and some of the strategies that are being done so that we can apply the same levers yeah. at our place. So if you, you know, if you do it at, you know, you know, the five million people at Northwestern and the four million people at Vanderbilt or whatever the number is and your place and all the other places around the table, then you might actually have an impact. Right. And some of it, is like, you know, there's, the blues are, are segmented, um, and, but Aetna is national. You know, so some, you know, some of these are going to be better done regionally. Yeah. Mark, I think we're hearing some disagreement with you. I know that's unusual for you to have face some Agree disagreement. Agreement, <laughs> agreement that is not easy, right? but that just strategically it may be possible. Yeah, I mean, I guess the point I was making was, again, I was framing it from the perspective of prioritization for NHGRI-funded research. And I don't think, I think Howard is absolutely right, that institutions that have relationships with payers that are interested in this can make the push, uh, but it's, it would be difficult for NHGRI as an institute to engage payers in a way that they would be interested in, in, in working. That, I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah but, but again, you know, one of the things that NHGRI has done very well in the past is coordinate. So if there were opportunities around genomic medicine issues to coordinate the people that typically sit around the table, that might actually go a long way. So it's against Howard code to go against a Howard, but um, <laughs> I'll go by my middle name for the next uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but but I, I think that if we're going to partner, and we've had many conversations with insurers also, um, I think the healthcare systems that are starting to deploy their ACO models and have resources that they're dumping in are more readily going to be players in this because they're investing in this. Uh, and the payers, I think, are, are the traditional payers are, are still trying to figure out what they want to do with this and they're tipping their toe into it. But I think getting some of these big systems in with the ACOs 
there's a real value structure for them down the road that they might be willing to come in and partner uh, to, to focus on how to do this and, and put real resources on the table that collectively you could think of it like a pre-compete type structure. They're all going to need to know how to do this. None of them have enough money. They all have enough money, but they're not going to spend that type of money uh, to do this as, uh, as a proof of principle. So, I, I mean, I think that's a good opportunity, Mark. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the reasons, and again, I don't, you know, I keep putting forward the Healthcare Systems Research Network is that because all of those groups are in that a ACO space, and I mean, they're the ones that are really doing it, and they have that, that those incentive alignments. So I, I think that's a good group to try and experiment with this where I, your likelihood of success is higher. Well, and, and maybe I could I could ask uh, our colleagues in the Division of Policy Communications and Education, Laura and, and Bob, to, to think a bit about, you know, one of the things that NHGRI has done, I think, reasonably well is, is this convening power that we have. And, and is there a way to sort of get, get ahead of this without necessarily putting a lot of research dollars in it that we that we don't have, but but could we in some way engage with them a, a little more effectively? I don't, I don't know. You know, it's just, you know, one thing where we are beginning to engage on the level of educating the uh, staff at, at insurers about genetics and genomics. We're part of the ISCC efforts, which is, which is wonderful. So. Um, we also heard about the, the idea of, of sort of cooperative sequencing groups like the cooperative oncology groups, um, which is an, an interesting idea. Uh, from time to time, I've heard people talk about a lot of different kinds of cooperative blank groups um, like the cooperative oncology groups, and, and so, so this might be a, you know, another one of those. On the other hand, uh, it might be something for us to, to be thinking about. So, um, or maybe that's what we're already doing in some of our, our existing studies. Bob? I guess it would, it would be interesting for me to know from the group uh, if that kind of convening would, would best start with health systems, convening health system directors, or trying to convene all the blues or um, and different uh, representatives of insurers, where would, where would the best place to start be? So, so that harkens back, I guess, to the, the previous point in terms of convening the payers. So we might ask Mark or, or others, um, what would be the best way to, to engage them? Or perhaps you can talk about that. The trade organization is the American Health Insurance Plans, AHIP, but that's also now pulled in with hospitals and their directors just left, so it'll be interesting to know um, how that will work. But um, again, there hasn't been a lot of energy around this, and, and I'm not, I, I think we could reach out to them, but whether they really would have any interest in, in, in substantively engaging, I don't know. I don't know who their medical director currently is. Um, but, I mean, we could, we could, the worst they can do is say we're not interested. Yeah. You, you could start with whatever the closest geographically uh, large ACO, accountable uh, care organization is, and try to work with, you know, their medical director and see whether, uh, certainly in the cancer space, they, they can't ignore this because the, the testing is expensive. Uh, if they do it, send it out, it's about five grand a t uh, patient. They, they, and they won't get fully reimbursed, and you're making decisions around $100,000 a year cancer drugs. So they all have to pay attention. And if you're an ACO, you definitely have to pay attention because it, you, know, you, make, you make one mistake and you sink the ship. You know, so so they, I think they would be likely a good place to start just to get a feel for it. If you want to do like a, just one, you know, one center, one, you know, one investigator type of thing. Although by the, uh, there's really, uh, I haven't found a payer yet that um, isn't interested in using genomic information when it's to avoid the use of a $100,000 a year medication. <laughs> that, that they, they said, don't confuse me with any additional evidence. We like this answer that we only have to treat 20 percent of the patients. Yeah. Okay, why don't, why don't we move on because we do have several other uh, panels to, to get through. And, and I'll just, I know people are getting tired. I'll, I'll just focus on the, on the kind of the ones that we initially identified as being high priority. So um, the, the, we talked about clinical trials of, added, of the added value of whole genome uh, to limited testing, kind of building on the experience that we're developing in these small programs. Those would be um, studies that I think we'd need to develop with our colleagues in other ICs. Any disagreement that, uh, that this kind of work should be done other than maybe making this plural? So. So we're not going to have just one that will uh, we'll do this, one great big one, yeah. 
Um, and then, and then the idea of this of crowdsourcing rare variants for assessing actionability and finding uh, causes and treatments. We we heard about Matt Might and and other patients uh, uh, who have been patient advocates who have have used this very effectively. It's not a model that NHGRI has supported. Um, and our our colleague from Picori will be back tomorrow. But uh, but obviously this is right up their alley in terms of of patient. Uh, you uh, actually uh, are supporting it, in through ClinGen, because uh, the gene matcher. Uh, which is part of the ClinGen project, is actually um, a, a start at being able to, you know, send information around. That's more at the gene level, but there's no reason that that couldn't be leveraged around uh, variants as well. And so I think that you're funding some of the infrastructure that would allow that anyway. Um, so this is uh, uh, Matt Mites' uh, idea, and I think it is something that could be funded in terms of ontologies. You've paid for ontologies in the past, which is um, a parent-oriented ontology. So one of the challenges for people that aren't medically trained, and he uses this in his example, is what's the medical term for my child doesn't tear when they cry? Right? So, I mean, I think that's another place to be thinking about. If we're going to really have patients trying to get accurate data in, they're going to write it with what they see and what they know. So if there's a way to take that ontology and connect it to the HPO and other areas, that could be something that would be hugely valuable. And, and that's something that Matt's been talking about as, as a potential idea. I would note that we're, we're planning to have a discussion with some of the Bacoy leadership, and Jeff, that might be, you know, an area that we can raise with them in terms of, uh, uh, you know, potentials for, for patient-related kinds of work. Okay. Uh, also, in, in the, the uh, changing evidence or as, as evidence evolves kind of uh, uh, range, um, what's, what would be the most effective way for clinicians to understand the meaning of variants, uh, particularly or especially uh, variants of unknown significance? Um, Howard suggested, you know, maybe what we need is, is like an unread, e, uh, an unread x-ray. Uh, clinicians, I mean, I can, I can go in my hospital and pull up an x-ray and try to read it myself, but then you better believe I go and look at the radiologist's report um, and, and see what they actually, you know, what the actual truth is. Um, so, so a genome consult service is something that you do in your hospital, I believe, to interpret these. Uh, maybe that's a, a direction we need to go in when people think of that. Okay, not, not getting a lot of traction, Howard. I don't know. I, but I think people are tired. Um, but okay. All right. Um, in terms of metrics and, and impact, there was a lot of enthusiasm for common data elements, a lot of uh, support for this, this work being done in Ignite, which, which uh, I think those involved in Ignite would note was a, was a hard pull to, to get done um, and, and is still a challenge to try to, to incorporate. Um, in addition, um, uh, measuring outcomes or identifying outcomes that are of value to lots of, of different stakeholders, uh, something that we have not done terribly well. I think scientifically and things that get through review tend to be, you know, outcomes that will get you published in the New England Journal. Um, and that's not necessarily what's of value to patients, payers, healthcare systems, providers, regulators, et cetera. Any disagreement with this being a sort of a key measure of, of metrics and impact? Okay. Uh, in addition, we, we heard, uh, um, you know, might there be a way of designing systems, this is a little bit off the topic, but that's all right, because it was a cool thing, uh, to guide the clinician to a specific test, so kind of point them in the direction of this is the test that you should be doing, whether those are automated tests, whether it's a genome consult service or, or some other uh, kind of approach, can we do the research to determine when you should do that and, and how best to do that? Is that a, a high research priority? Seeing some nods at least, so okay, great. Um, and engaging societies, there, you know, in many ways, they're they're another stakeholder that need to be um, uh, engaged. Um, this idea of an implementation commons, I might ask whoever suggested that was that you, Mark? Um, Jeff, had first Jeff. The, you, know, I, I, you know, Jeff had raised the concept, um, and I, we didn't press him on what exactly he meant by that. But um, as I think about uh, a commons, it's really you know, an opportunity uh, where a shared space where we're all, you know, uh, using same tools, same language, same outcomes. So the idea that um, it would build on uh, what you had in the first slide, that there would be common methodologies, but it would go beyond that. It would be uh, an environment where different projects would be sharing more about what they're doing. And, and the Genomic Medicine Group, this meeting in particular, is 
bringing together leadership of all of the different groups. But this is really the first time we've had that type of a meeting. And so, you know, God knows, I don't think any of us want more meetings. But the idea that, um, you know, having a steering committee of steering committees where you could, you could really on a regular basis share what is coming out of all the different projects and say, oh, that's something we need to be doing. And, and we could, you know, hammer out these, um, you know, uh, the differences between programs to achieve more commonality. The building on the, the work that um, has been done to say, well, let's have the EHR groups talk together on a regular basis to do it more at a programmatic level. That's at least the way I've conceptualized it. I don't know if that has anything to do with how, what, how Jeff is thinking of an uh, implementation commons. So sorry to hit you with that as you walk back in the room, but we were, we were a little the, curious as to, as to what an implementation commons would look like if you can. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think I'll also see if Julie or, or Erwin want to comment, but I think in the Ignite program, um, you know, whether it's implementing pharmacogenetics, uh, genetic risk testing, family history, what have you, there are going to be some, there are some common themes um, and challenges that we've all faced and that we have uh, begun to overcome or are overcoming, as well as things that are pretty unique to those, those areas. And, uh, you know, our intent is to write those up, of course, for public dissemination, but um, as other programs which are doing similar implementation programs for genome sequencing and the like um, uh, could, could contribute to that. and make it a, uh, almost a repository, perhaps with some metadata that would give an, an, a manual of operations, essentially, for uh, the, 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 the less genomically inclined institutions to know what they're going to need to do to bring some of these technologies in could be quite valuable. So th this whole topic raises some actually quite fundamental sort of conceptual questions. I don't know where those get addressed, whether in this portfolio or in other portfolios, but um, so the sort of traditional measures of value would have to do with things, as was discussed earlier, like how long does somebody live, quality of life, uh, cost. You know, traditional cost utility analyses can be reduced to those things. But here we're talking about things like what's the value of ending a diagnostic odyssey? What's the value of the reduction of uncertainty that comes with getting a diagnosis? Some of these things can't actually reduce, be reduced, I think, to any of the traditional measures of value. So we, I think we need to think a little bit outside those usual measures to how do we value at least some of the outcomes of the genomic medicine, at least where it stands today. Great. Thanks. And I think Mark had called on Julie or Irvin if you wanted to make any additional comments, or are you good? Two more guys, we're almost done. Um, all right, so in, in terms of uh, EHR functionality, uh, uh, Rex's group, there were a number of things raised. Um, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't highlight any of, of these, forgive me. Um, um, and, and Perhaps they're, all I, they're all important. That's right, and we and we can't. Um, I, you know, one that that seemed like we you know is a, is a real opportunity. It was this last one in terms of multiple training programs. So so we heard there were a number of training programs now ongoing in, in EHRs and and informatics and you know with the, the big new initiatives. You know, couldn't we engage some of those trainees? We're we're dealing with I think some some really thorny problems that that could be solved informatically, and we don't have the resources or tools to do that. Um, and and is there a way to work with them to say, you know, hey, you're, you need a fellows project. Um, can, can you work on one of these? Maybe that's something for us to think about a bit more. So we can make that one, uh, make that one blue real quick here. All right. And Rex, were there um, others from your group? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, we've, actually, we have a, uh, a second one, and then, then I'll ask you if there were any that we missed that were, were critical. Um, it's something that seems to be a, a really genomic research question that, that we should be able to address is when is the phenotype measure superior to or does it add to information from the genotype? And we heard a couple, we heard, uh, you know, one example of TPMT where, where the assay, because you don't know all of the variants, you can measure them, but you really want to know the activity as well. Um, did I get that right, Mary? No? Not quite. Well, I mean. It, it, that's the limitation of every genetic test is that you don't know that you're finding all the damaging variants. So, I mean, I just, I just don't see, it, it's always going to be true that knowing phenotype would be helpful. The downside of phenotype is, is that it usually changes over time and it might be artifactually affected by biochemicals floating around in whatever tissue you're phenotyping. 
Exactly. So I don't, again, I don't see why it really, setting up an either or dichotomy seems a little unusual to me. I mean, we, we're, we're, there's many examples where we'd like to know both. If it's not too expensive, we want to know both. Okay, all right. So let's un, unblue that one. Yeah. Um, but uh, although I might, I might note that, that HFE, the hemochromatosis variant, was one that, that actually NHLBI and NHGRI did an entire study on, the, the air study, trying to ask that question. And it turned out the genotype really wasn't all that helpful because the penetrance was so low. And, and really what you want, because there's gene environment interaction and other things. Now, you disagree with that, Mary, you look like, or, oh, oh, good, okay. I was reading you wrong. <laughs> The eMERGE data, at least for the homozygotes, would contravene that uh, argument. There's much higher penetrance than was uh, uh, reported in the study. And that uh, may go to show the difference between a study versus a, a, a real-world setting. Um, so uh, I mean, those are, those are important considerations. And, and you kind of put it on Mary. I think I was the one that opened my big mouth about the uh, enzyme activity versus the um, the genotype, but and I think Mary is absolutely correct that you know you you want what you want is what's most informative for the patient, and I think sometimes because we're titled the Genomic Medicine Working Group that we focus in and and assume that because genomic is in our name that genomic is always the best, but I think we need to be uh, of the belief that there may be situations where genomic isn't the best, and it would be incumbent on us for to say, you know, in this case, it's really not the genomic information that's the most relevant. It is some, something else, whether it be phenotype or, uh, or some other intermediate biomarker or something. I think in some cases when the phenotype is in some ways more informative than the genotype, it's because that phenotype is closer to what is clinically actionable and clinically meaningful. It is a, it is a downstream endpoint that's closer to what we can actually do something with. In some cases, the genotype information is too far away from that endpoint for us to effectively translate that knowledge into something that we can act on in the clinic. So one of the caveats to this point could be, as our understanding of how to translate that genetic information into a, a more accurate phenotypic model of what's going on at a cellular and tissue level improves, our ability to utilize the genetic information to make these kind of predictions will also improve. But right now we're being limited by our limited uh, ability to do that translation. As those models improve, that'll change. And I think you can imagine cases where actually knowing the genotype might cause you to look more carefully for phenotype in the future. So. Uh, you know, there's that value as well. It, it sounds as though we agree that this is an important topic. Maybe it's not the most important topic when it comes to EHR functionality, uh, but one that we, so we're going we're gonna to leave it as, as a white one. Okay. Um, great. And, and I, I think we, we did hear um, that, that the, the value of precise phenotyping may vary uh, depending on the frequency of the variant, and perhaps uh, it's more important with the rare variants than it, than it has seemed to be with the common variants. I'm, I'm not sure that that has been proven yet. Um, but it's one that, that seems to make sense. Would everyone agree that that's probably a direction we would, we would agree on at least or, or some, something that needs to be demonstrated? Or is that not a terribly important thing? We're going to be doing precise phenotyping anyway with rare variants and so, so not something we need to highlight. I, I think it's really important. I think we're talking about rare, highly penetrant variants where one or two variants probably are governing a complex phenotype, medically complex patients. And there I see it just every day as, as a real bottleneck for us. Well, and I think the, the point that was made uh, about the study earlier was that um, what we're really talking about is um, the, the asymptote. In other words, how much phenotyping investment do you need to get the answer that's good enough to do what you need to do? And I think that th this is a subset of the point that for things uh, where you have larger numbers of patients and, and larger numbers of variants that, that you will tolerate a fair amount of noise. Um, but you know, with uh, things where there's very rare variants, then you may need to invest more. But I think it really is more research around the idea of you know, what is a good enough versus a perfect phenotype and what's the best way to, um, uh, to, to use resources because you could, 
expend infinite resources. It's a speed of light question. You can keep spending resources and never actually get to the perfect phenotype. I also think coming from the, you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas perspective, one of the most remarkable things, oh, oh sorry, I'm back here in the corner. <laughs> Um, you know, coming from the Cancer Genome Atlas perspective, the most, to me, the, one of the most amazing things that that project has done is help redefine what do we mean when we say different types of cancer, and some of that starts to become using the molecular information to define the cancer, but then I put my epidemiology bat hat back on. And I start to think, well, what happens if we go back to GWAS studies defined by these different molecular types of cancer, because it may be that the genetic predispositions for these different cancers come into play. And so I just wonder, as genomic medicine goes forward, are there going to be similar redefinitions of disease or subcategorization of disease that you're going to need to have this more accurate phenotyping to be able to sort of see and research and capitalize on? So that's another argument in the more precise phenotyping corner. Perhaps another way of thinking of this is not just more precise phenotyping, but also thinking about secondary phenotyping. If you look for um, loss of immune, uh, loss of adaptive immune function, that's quite common, and it happens through a number of unrelated mechanisms. But then if you look for unusual um, overlap, like loss of adaptive immune system and no hair from birth, it turns out that is a rare uh, particular set of causes, and the combination of phenotypes leads you to the correct uh, cause of disease and the correct disease subset. Cool. So, so not only the precise phenotyping being what you what you think you're looking for, and sorry, I can't see you, Mike, but uh, but anyway, but also looking at sort of related things or secondary things. Okay, great. All right. So, Rex, um, um, did we sort of? Pretty much capture, you think, at least as a first pass, key things from your group. Okay. And then last but not least on the, on the diversity uh, issues, a number of things that came up. Um, I think one that, was, uh, that w would be helpful to us at NHGRI is to identify specific health disparities for sure questions related to genomics that we can uh, then, you know, um, study in a variety of different ways. And, and, you know, obviously there are Mendelian conditions that are unique to, to uh, uh, just about any um, ethnicity, but, but also when, when looking specifically at health disparities, how to address that. Um, and then the point being made that, uh, that, you know, diverse populations are particularly important in pediatrics. I think thanks to Steve and others for making that point, um, that, that given that we're, we're just about at a majority population in the, is this under 18, under 12, Steve, do you remember which, what age group you're? The, the way that the um, thing I looked at, it was the 56 percent was 5 to 13. It's actually going to be even more, in, it, you know, it just gets more and more um, minority as you get younger. So younger, it was like 58 percent in the 14 to 17 year old, and then it kept going down by a couple of percentage points in each age really? bracket. Really? Wow. Okay. Great. All right. So, so that seemed to be, uh, uh, both of those seem to be high priority areas uh, for diversity. Any disagreement? Yes, ma'am. Um, on the last one, I, I don't know if you have this on the next slide, but could the last one also include interpretation, discovery and interpretation, potentially? Uh, so on the, on the last on the last question. Bullet. So on need better bullet. methods to utilize ethnic genomes for discovery and interpretation? And interpretation, sure. Uh, discovery, analytically, and interpretation. I'll, I'll fix it later. So, okay. Great. All right. Um, and then other things, uh, you know, I think we've got some interesting points about giving community advisory boards, boards not only a voice, but, you know, a strong voice and, and independence and autonomy and the ability to push back um, when needed um, against investigators, maybe not against, but at least uh, uh, to, to be sure that they're heard. Um, we, we talked a bit about uh, dedicated programs for non-European uh, ancestry populations for a whole variety of reasons. Those have seemed to be successful in some settings, and, and maybe that's the, you know, we need to go further in that direction. And again, uh, that's something that we could talk about. Um, and, then, and then one kind of wonders, is, is there a way to make genomics that's kind of a special draw? Is there, is there something unique about it that we could attract training, other than the fact that it's super cool um, and, and, you know, everybody should be uh, training in genomics, but, but what is it about genomics that, that would be particularly attractive uh, to, to non-European ancestry uh, trainees? Um, and those seem to be areas that, that were, you know, kind of, kind of real areas of opportunity. Any disagreement about, the, about those as being useful areas to pursue? Okay. Great. We're just about at the end, um, and five minutes early, I, I think. So. Eight. Eight minutes early. All right. Fantastic. Uh, so a, a reminder, we'll be starting again at 8.30.
tomorrow morning? Okay. Um, and yes, Howard. Could you send these around? Uh, sure. For this evening, so when we're okay. less brain dead, or at least when I'm less brain dead, I can look at them again. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. So I'll just re uh, uh, reply to, to reader's note to, to everybody. So we'll reconvene at 8.30. Thank you all very much for, for your attention and participation. We'll see you then.